Hello, everyone. Hello. On behalf of the Rockefeller Center, welcome to the last Rocky Watch event of the term. We are pleased to host New York Times international correspondent, Alyssa Johansson Rubin, and our host for the event, adjunct professor Alexis Jetter. Tonight's event is the 2021 Bernard D. Nossiter Lecture, which was established in 1994 to honor Mr. Nossiter and his contributions to journalism. He was a member of the class of 1947, a reporter for the Washington Post, and the Euro UN Bureau Chief at the New York Times. We're pleased to have this event in his honor. Before we get started, a couple of Zoom details. You may ask your questions at any time by using the Q&A button. To upvote a question that you would like to see answered, click on the thumbs up icon. Questions with the most votes will rise to the top. Asking your questions early increases the chances that they get asked. To access Zoom's closed captioning fe feature, navigate to the live transcript button and select show subtitle. And if you don't see that option, look under the more button. And finally, when you leave tonight, you will see a three question survey. We'd be very grateful if you would take the time to answer the three short questions you'll see there. It is now my great pleasure to introduce our host for the evening, adjunct professor in women's, gender and sexuality studies and the Department of English at Dartmouth College, Alexis Jetter. Thank you all. Thank you, Joanne. Thank you, Bob. Uh, thank you everyone from the Rockefeller Center uh, for every year making this possible. Usually I teach a class um, this time of year and I could host someone like Alyssa at, in my class. So my loss is that I can't do that in person, but I'm so excited. Um, can you hear me, by the way? Can you hear me? Okay. Um, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about Alyssa and um, how her work fits into kind of a larger framework of the kind of uh, exciting, demanding, incredibly difficult journalism that's going on now. Alyssa has been a foreign correspondent for 20 years, I believe. She's uh, run the Paris Bureau, the Baghdad Bureau, and the K Kabul Bureau uh, for the New York Times and also uh, for the LA Times before that. But I, I spent today uh, researching uh, Alyssa. And what's interesting to me about Alyssa, there's many things, but she's known for her foreign correspondent work and she's won the Pulitzer for that and many other top awards. But she started out in Wichita, Kansas, covering farmers. And I think it's really wonderful to look at the kind of insight and sensitivity that uh, Alyssa brought to all the stories she did about farmers in the Midwest and also um, about abortion in the US and healthcare. And if you look at her current stories, which of course can be devastating to read about women suicide bombers or women who have had acid thrown in their faces and are forming a new family of their own in these women's shelters, uh, which are sheltered from their own families in some ways in, um, in Afghanistan. You'll see the threads of that same sensitivity, that same um, um, exquisite ability to listen and capture and to bring, um, you know, it's a, it's a cliche, you know, to bring humanity, to pull out the humanity from these places of such grotesque, um, unimaginable cruelty. But that's what Alyssa does. You almost can't look at the stories, but then you do. And I teach her work. Um, I teach her work, I read her work, I think about her work. And so it, it's a total honor to have you with us today, Alyssa. And I, I, um, I'll try to stop talking and long enough for you to talk. You know, at first I wanna to start uh, to, to read what people, what you've won and what people write about you. And then I wanna step back from that and talk about how you write a little bit more and also how you've written about some things that have happened to you. So this is on the occasion uh, in um, 2016 when Alyssa won the Pulitzer Prize uh, for her, you know, war, cars, war correspondence, but actually it's her coverage of people behind the lines. Um, a foreign correspondent, this says 15 years, now it's 20. Alyssa Rubin is known for descending deep into some of the world's scariest conflicts and returning with rare, often poignant glimpses into the plights of soldiers, survivors, and victims. On Monday, the Pulitzer Prize Board gave Ms. Rubin its International Reporting Work Award for her 2015 work on Afghanistan, where it said she delivered deeply reported, moving articles about the struggle to improve the lives of women. Um, 
And it says, since joining the LA Times, she spent most of her time covering Iraq, Afghanistan, and the Balkans. And I want to move to this one moment in time. Um, and I should say that I've never met Alyssa before, but we have a very good friend in common. So I've been hearing some of these things like, how did Alyssa survive you know, the, the helicopter uh, attack? And, and this is something maybe some of you have heard about, and perhaps some of you haven't. Um, some of her work was sometimes harrowing. In August of 2014, Ms. Rubin was in a helicopter that crashed while delivering aid to Yazidi refugees in Iraq, Kurdistan, Iraqi Kurdistan. She suffered severely broken wrists and a fractured skull. Later, as she narrated the experience from a hospital bed in Baghdad, she wrote about it while she was still wrapped up in all kinds of bandages and attached to I don't know how many tubes. Her concerns instead focused on the refugees and the pilot. And this is a quote from her piece. I heard myself groan like everybody else. At that moment, it just hurt so much. But then I thought, that's good. At least I'm alive. I bet a lot of them are not. How is the pilot? Did he make it? He just wanted to help. And of course, the pilot did not make it. A number of people in that helicopter did not make it. Um, She's won, in addition to the Pulitzer, the John Chancellor Award, the Michael Kelly Award. And I wanted to quote from uh, Alyssa. I asked her, okay, what do you want me to say? What do you not want me to say? Um, and she wrote this. Uh, I'm fortunate to have won a lot of awards. So while the Pulitzer is, of course, important to me, I am at least as honored to have won the John Chancellor Award and the Michael Kelly Award, both of which recognize integrity which is an interesting word and a really important word, I think, in the work that you do, Alyssa. Um, and the chancellor, especially, because it's a, it, it honors a body of work rather than a single project. Being a journalist is a lifelong commitment, not a single flashy project. It's bringing your mind and heart and scruples and discernment to the work every day of your life. I really appreciate that an award recognizes that. And here I thought this would be fun because it tweaks a lot of my students thinking, oh, should I go to journalism school? Should I not? Should I major in poli sci or English? You know, I don't know. And she writes, I think it's important that I did not go to journalism school. I was trained and remained devoted to the humanities writ large. My major in college was Renaissance studies and I studied classics Latin almost as much. It breaks my heart that so many people are so pre-professional but cannot write clearly and by extension do not think clearly. So it's interesting to me that Alyssa is spending her year at Neiman, which is the foundation at, um, at Harvard that gives full-time journalists, uh, usually fairly far along in their careers, sometimes newer, a year off to study whatever they wanted. And you know, I would have thought, well, of course Alyssa is gonna study something about, you know, I don't know, because she's so interested in so many aspects of war coverage. I mean, she's looking at she's looking at climate change. She's looking at weapon technology. She's looking at epidemiology. She's looking at environmental contamination from some of those that bombing. But no, and I'd love for you to talk about this. What are you studying? The Old Testament. You're studying the Old Testament, and and when you talk about um, about war, and I'll close here so that you can actually talk about uh, your own work. Um, and I'm quoting you here too. To me, reporting on war is like reporting on life. War is one of the activities of human beings. They've been doing it forever and they will do it forever. You can't really isolate it. But if you read the classics, like the Iliad, you're reading about battles, about love affairs, about the difficulty of repairing boats. You're reading about the weather a lot. They're all part of understanding the zone of conflict. The, this idea that covering uh, that covering wars and covering war zones is really about covering the people, the very the specifics of what's happening to that people, those people in that time, but also the universality of it. You know, sort of the um, I mean, the women in the stories that you write about. Mostly, it's it's I teach the stories where you really zoom in on the women who are. Um, who are bearing so much of the burden of the larger war in, in their own bodies, in their own families. Um, but this idea that we can go back to some kind of universal truths about it or some universal wisdom about it is also very interesting to me. So um, I wanna open up uh, your talk and I wanna invite people to uh, you know, contribute uh, their questions. Of course, today we're hoping Maybe we'll see a diminution at least of some of the violence in Gaza 
Uh, certainly, I'm sure people want to ask you about Afghanistan um, and uh, because of the drawdown of troops in a place where you've spent so much time. And um, really, they can, you guys can ask her about the Iliad and the Old Testament. So go for it. <laughs> well, thank you, Alexis, for that extraordinary introduction. And I only hope that um, my rather, rather um, simple talk li lives up to a, a tiny piece of it. Um, let me say good, good evening and good morning and good afternoon, depending on where you are in the world. And thank you so much for coming to this. Um, and I wanted to start very briefly by thanking the family of Bernard Nossiter, his sons, Joshua, Daniel, Adam, and Jonathan, who have created and sustained this annual lecture and who've remained involved for more than 20 years in choosing the lecturer. I also want to thank Dartmouth College for hosting the Nostra Lecture. It is so, so important that universities remain safe places for the debate of ideas and places where people feel they can express their views and explain them to others rather than just being sucked into uh, these bite-sized battles on social media in which no one's mind is open to new thoughts, much less changed by them. And finally, I want to thank the Rockefeller Center for Public Policy and their terrific staff for making this happen. But most of all, I want to thank Bernard Nossiter, whose journalistic work I sadly knew little of when I was asked to give this talk. But as I delved into it, I found some of his ideas formed more than 50 years ago to be an ideal taking off point for some of the problems facing journalism today, as well as for thinking about American policy. As you, you may know, he was widely traveled. He had worked in many, many countries around the world and had thought long and hard about the influence the United States wields in the world, both through its economic choices, but also through its political ones. In his book titled The Myth Makers, he quotes from a speech of President John F. Kennedy that is strikingly pertinent today. Quote, the great enemy of the truth is not the lie, deliberate, contrived, and dishonest, but the myth, persistent, persuasive, and unrealistic. Sorry. Just the gap there. Today, the enemy of truth sometimes is the outright lie, but as Bernard Nossiter's quote from President Kennedy suggests, there's something deeper going on here the power of the attractive myth to obscure complex realities. It is the myth underlying the lie, the belief or story that is unmoored from facts that often sticks. And it is rooted not necessarily in malice, though sometimes, but in culture, in human frailty, in bigotry, and in expediency. People don't want to take the time to understand complicated situations. I am going to briefly describe the current rather dismal situation for journalism, suggest a few of the elements that got us here, and then propose some steps that journalists can take to start restore, to restore confidence in the work they do and possibly increase their impact and that are drawn from my own work. The erosion of belief in mainstream journalism and the rise of more myth-driven media has accelerated over the past few years with two trends intersecting, a drop in the overall trust of major news organizations and an ever increasing partisan split so that those who self-identify as more conservative or more liberal no longer trust the same sources. <clears throat> According to a synthesis of surveys of trust in the media by, of trust in the media by Morning Consult, a data intelligence and research firm, between 2016 and 2020, there was about a 9% drop in trust of major news organizations. That means, according to their data, that today about 52% of Americans trust what journalists write. But if you dig deeper, you find that number is deceptively favorable. A study by the Pew Foundation in 2019 found that Republicans and those who lean Republican have drastically lower levels of trust in mainstream media, more like 30%, and trust instead Fox talk shows and Breitbart rather than say the New York Times or ABC or NBC. And by the same ratios, Democrats distrust those very sources that Republicans turn to. This 
poses an existential question for those of us who work as journalists for what we once assumed were widely accepted news outlets, such as the New York Times or CBS or major news and feature magazines, the wire services. How do we reach a broad audience if those who are suspicious of the media in general and the mainstream media in particular do not read what we write or listen to our broadcasts or watch our documentaries or podcasts? Or if they do listen to them, do not believe them, then what difference do we make? And if people reflexively believe that anything questioned or discredited by the mainstream media must be true because the mainstream media is hiding something or doing the bidding of unseen forces, then I and most journalists I know are deepening divisions with our reporting rather than narrowing them. As a longtime user of such publications as the briefings of the Congressional Research Service and reports from the United Nations High Commission on Refugees and the High Commission on Human Rights, organizations that go out and collect data either from other government sources or in the case of the UN from the ground, I fear that my very reliance on such sources makes them suspect, less credible to readers. And if people no longer pay attention to sources like the Centers for Disease Control or the readings gathered by the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, sometimes called NOAA, or the Federal Elections Commission or the Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms Administration, one can go on and on here, then where do we even start to have a discussion? I'm not saying that these institutions are infallible and to be sure they should be reported on with rigor and their have always been occasionally mistakes, as there is with most data gathering efforts, but their information offered us some shared ground. But today there's no longer agreement that these institutions offer reliable information. There's an entire industry that disputes them and undermines this kind of data, not just daily, but hourly on social media. The implications of this are frightening. If we can't trust and use the same facts? How can we even talk about many of the most basic problems facing our country? How can we agree about how to deal with global climate change if we don't even agree on whether climate change is happening and won't trust the, observ the ob observatories such as NOAA's? How can we protect the country from the coronavirus with a vaccine if so many people between 25 and 30 three, 35% do not trust the vaccine and have no current plans to obtain a dose. There's similar doubts over who won the last presidential election and over immigration. Will immigrants take away jobs Americans want? Does the presence of foreign students harm American students? Are millions of Mexicans, Guatemalans, Hondur and Hondurans coming into the country in a vast tidal wave? Do we need to spend billions on a wall or would a gate and a process for the admission of those who qualify make more sense. On each of these issues, who's reporting and which information secures a broad audience? If people do not read journalism because they think it is biased and do not accept the people or institutions quoted, then how can we go forward? And even more worrying, does the media, especially the mainstream media, delegitimize some of those institutions that used to be relied on? If people either do not read what we write or immediately discount it, then a journalist's raison d'etre, their power in the public square to add to the debate and to help people make sense of the complexities of modern life is lost. Before I go on to suggest some remedies to this bleak picture, let's ask quickly, how did we get here? How we got here is very complicated and I'm really just going to try to deal with one aspect of it that seems particularly important in this context. And that was the development of the internet, which not only spawned social media, but placed a number of different forms of news, um, which the casual reader or, or watcher, um, we put a number of different forms of news sort of in front of the casual reader or watcher so that they might reasonably assume that the different news sources were, were equal in some way. That in turn made it difficult for people to distinguish which news was true and which facts they, they should trust. 
One example from my own paper, the New York Times was shocked to discover that the dateline at the top of the stories of overseas correspondents or national correspondents was meaningless to most people. Readers had no idea that it meant the person who was writing the story was actually in the place where the story was happening or nearby to that place. In other words, they were reporting on what they were actually seeing. This means in the starkest terms that if I put on an abaya and go into a turbulent refugee camp in Pakistan, that my report, if, when it's publicized on the internet, is viewed as indistinguishable, indistinguishable from what someone else writes about the same camp from his desk in, say, Hanover, New Hampshire, even though those two reports are deeply different. Most people never got to hear the brilliant Los Angeles Times editor, John Carroll, explain, as he did in one of our, our company meetings, that you can judge a publication's adherence to honesty by its corrections policy. Corrections, forthright, thorough, and fast, tell you that a publication cares about its accuracy. But if you don't know that, and you don't know how to distinguish reliable news from unreliable news, you don't know what cr criteria to apply as you read, then you just succumb to the myth that makes sense to you within your context. It is hard for news outlets themselves to credibly highlight these distinctions, but I am grateful to organizations like the News Literacy Project that have dedicated themselves to educating our youngest readers in the schools about how to evaluate news sources and to read critically, asking whether an article seems reported and how many people it quotes and what kinds of sources it relies on and whether the outlet issues corrections. I believe we need far more of that. Given this situation though, what can journalists, individual journalists and journalist, journalism organizations do to improve the situation? I recently delved into the work of Amanda Ripley, a former journalist for Time Magazine, the New York Times Magazine and other outlets, and most recently the writer of the fascinating book, High Conflict, why we get trapped and how we get out, which looks at how conflict and profound disagreements in the United States, both within groups and between them, has crippled our ability to move forward in multiple arenas. arenas. I was particularly interested in what she had to say about journalism because I have my own ideas about steps we need to take in the context of covering foreign affairs. Amanda Ripley has three or four basic pieces of advice, and they all have to do with ideas that sound simple, but putting them into action is, would have to be a conscious effort. The overarching one is to show the complications in the story, to eschew the arguments back and forth that so often characterize televised and internet debates. How can we do that? One way is instead of asking questions that easily elic elicit a yes or no answer or an up or down, sort of thumbs up, thumbs down, ask questions that push the person being interviewed to look at the broader issues. Instead of how is President Biden doing on vaccinations, ask what is stopping so many Americans from getting vaccinated? That way, those who like or dislike President Biden cannot veer into a short, he's doing a great job or he's doing a terrible job. Instead, they're being asked to think with the reporter about the problem, the why, rather than the politics. Also, their opinion, this, the person you're interviewing, their opinion is being sought. They become an expert too. They are being respected and their views are being respected. Secondly, in writing and reporting, widen the lens. Context, context, context. As an American who has lived overseas for more than 20 years and worked in more than 25 countries, one of my first questions is, what do other countries do about a particular problem and how has it worked out for them? When you add that information to the journalism you're, you're, to the journalism you're writing, you open people's minds to the idea of other approaches instead of miring a discussion in charged American politics. Part of context is history, recent and not so recent. I remember when I was covering the war in Kosovo and a Kosovo Serb I was interviewing about the ethnic cleansing being done in Kosovar Albanian villages by Serbs began to quote from a Serbian poem about all that the Serbs had lost in Kosovo. 
When I inquired whether it was the Second World War or in the First World War, he looked at me pityingly and drew himself up to his full height. Madam, he said, that was the great battle of 1389 against the Turks, making it sound as if his father might have fought in it, except it was 700 years earlier. But it wasn't 700 years ago to him. It still was in his cultural group memory. My third piece of advice is to practice or a sort of radical empathy. This is really my thought, not Amanda Ripley's. It's to try to understand people's motivations, to try to see the world and explain the world from their point of view. This is my constant mantra. Put yourself in the shoes of the person you are interviewing. That person can be a battered woman in Afghanistan, a member of Congress, an Al Qaeda operative. Every one of them got to where you met them after living a particular life in a particular place or places. They also worked in a particular industry or held a particular position that exerted its own pressures. I feel that to really understand them and tell their story, I have to see it through their eyes. That does not mean losing track of one's moral bearings or if they are unsavory characters, ex excusing whatever they did. Rather, it means laying it out so that the reader or viewer considers the underlying issues rather than just superficial ones. I've often tried to frame or report my articles with an eye towards nuance or contradiction or the unexpected, but at the same time make them accessible. Are suicide bombers incomprehensibly horrible? Or are they people, if not like us, people whose actions make sense within the circumstances in which they are living? This need not excuse them, but might allow a conversation about how to change those circumstances, at least some of the time. How do civil civilian casualties happen? Are they intentional? What are the components? And can they be changed? changed? The answer is sometimes. I want to suggest to the reader or viewer who might have a preconceived idea about what I'm trying to write about, a different way of seeing the material. So I need to write it in a way that the reader might trust. What does that mean? It means choosing details that a reader might recognize. It means having a diversity of voices so that no one can accuse an article of being one-sided. And it means making sure that there are voices on the ground so it does not sound as if I'm handing down wisdom from Mount Olympus. One example of this is a profile I wrote of Najem Lashraoui, the man who made the bombs in the 2016 attacks in Belgium that killed 32 people and probably made the suicide vests worn by the attackers in Paris at the end of 2015. There is a tendency to demonize terrorists and to write them off as irredeemable. irredeemable. But Najin Lashraoui's story makes us wonder what the society could have done differently to avoid the terrible outcome that happened. Lashraoui, in his early life, was a recognizable, high-achieving immigrant. Born in Morocco, he had been a good student, graduated from a Catholic school in Belgium, went on to university to study engineering and whose parents valued education. His younger brother was a martial arts champion and is on Belgium's national team, but he felt lonely and left out by his largely non-Arab Catholic classmates. And he became alienated and then drawn to a Salafist preacher from a more extreme branch of Islam who made him feel he belonged. From there, he was persuaded to go to Syria and join ISIS. A very different story is that of those who per perpetuated the regime of Saddam Hussein. It seemed to lots of Americans and to Paul Bremer, who was leading the American reconstruction effort in Iraq after the overthrow of Saddam, that the way to cut off Saddam's influence after his ouster was to purge all those who were from his Ba'athist party from the government and to disband the military. He seemed to give little thought, and that goes for American, all the American policymakers, to the reality that the policy meant summarily cutting off the salary and retirement benefits of hundreds of thousands of men, or people in the case of some of the government employees, and their families. 
The failure to understand how many different kinds of people had worked for Saddam and for the Ba'athist regime and to evaluate whether each of them was necessarily dangerous ended up leading to Al-Qaeda in Iraq because it ensured there were all these disaffected followers who were suddenly rendered powerless and penniless and humiliated because they had lost their standing in the society. And so they had little or nothing to lose by joining a terrorist group. One way I felt I could convey that complexity was to write profiles of people who had supported Saddam for different reasons, but who in themselves did not seem to be dangerous. I could go on much longer. I could talk about an Iraqi would-be female suicide bomber who lost all of her relatives in American bombings, justified or unjustified, it's hard to know. But the result was she had no one to protect her, no older brothers, no father, no uncle. What was left for her? In her eyes, very little other than a forced marriage. I could also talk about the fraught choices for American soldiers in Afghanistan when they bombed terrorist redoubts. It was almost inevitable that many of those bombings would result in civilian casualties as well as Taliban casualties, but would do little to rid the country of the Taliban. The point I'm making about each of these stories is that to, extent that to the extent that the people or the situations at their center present something unexpected or contradictory, we as journalists should not shy away from those details because they may confound people's preconceived notions. And as Amanda Ripley suggests, widen the aperture. It's a tricky balancing act to be sure because if there is too much complexity, the reader gets lost or may lose interest altogether. But for the most part, there are no simple stories and no one who plays any of the roles I just described does so without being shaped by their entire life and environment. That does not mean that every story can be told in depth, but that we owe it to our craft, to the reader and to those we are covering to try to understand the full context in which people act as they do. There may be no true news as opposed to fake news, but for sure, there is truer news, and that is what we should aspire to convey. Thank you very much. Uh, wow, Alyssa, thank you. That was wonderful. And um, it's so much, it, what you said captures what I love about your work, which is that it's not simple. It's complicated. You have to take the entirety of the person's life, not just their life, their parents' life, their grandparents' life. A war that's as vivid to a man 700 years later as it is what happened to us yesterday, you know? Um, and I, I think that's what's powerful about your work. I think that's also what takes a long time. And, you know, there is a level that there's a responsibility on the part of readers to want to, you know, to take the time to read those stories. And sometimes you've been, often you've been paired with amazing photojournalists. So the piece about the, you know, what we'd call the battered women's shelter in, I don't know if it was outside Kabul, you know, with the Lindsay Adario, which is yeah. amazing. And, and the fact that these women who are scarred literally by, by their attackers still want to, you know, get up in the morning and look beautiful and they have their children and they have their, their own sort of families with these other women. I mean, I think there's a lot that you, by taking the time and not pressing stereotypes on people, but instead just sitting and listening as you do so beautifully, you're not a blank slate, obviously, you ask a lot of questions, but that complexity, and so they're not victims. I mean, the terrible but, but things- but Not happen. only victims anyway, yeah. Right, I mean, what you wrote somewhere or said sometime was, um, it's hard for people to deal with some, to see some of the horrible cruelty that people inflict on others. And when you're, when you're writing about these stories, you, you think about that and you realize, well, you were horribly shocked too. You, you want people to be shocked, but you don't want them to be numbed. And I, I guess my, my first question is that, how do, you, how do you write about such extreme cruelty, such terrible um, costs, just what people are capable of doing to each other, not just in war zones, but elsewhere, without risking that people will just get numbed out and say, you know, I can't read anymore, or turn the page or. Um, 
I think, I think if you humanize the person, then you're following the person and you want them to survive. Mm-hmm. Right. And so, or you want to, you know, you, you have to have some protagonist, a, a character um, who, who the narrator, who, who the, the reader can, can glom onto and have hope for. I do think it's very hard to suggest there's no hope. And I suppose I always believe there's a little hope, but I don't want people to be unrealistic about the amount. I mean, the, the women in the shelters, I always want to make the point they're not, they are actually heroes as every bit as much as they are victims. But I also want people to understand they can't leave the shelter because they're at risk of being killed. So they are they are stronger than they seem, but they are also terribly constrained. And that and that combination is it, it's the society that's there. And you know, maybe I I have to hope that people will be interested enough in the survival part that they keep reading. Well, I think it works. I think it does work. And I think there's the, the power of the story. You know, I am, I am struck by the fact that you majored in classics and Renaissance studies and that you're reading the Old Testament now. That suggests to me that you're interested in the power of stories, particularly as they oh, yeah. fracture into religion. And you've got to be dealing with religious issues when you're covering these wars from the Balkans to Afghanistan, to Iraq, to Syria. I mean. Is it really about religion? Is religion just kind of a, 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 a glue that other things adhere to and it gets called religion? How do you sort all that out? Um, well, I, I actually spent this year studying, I, I, my goal was to do study some of each of the three monotheistic religions that I, I have lived with the past uh, 20 years. So, so Christianity, um, Sort of Judea, not so much Judaism, but the Old Testament at least, and Islam. Mm-hmm. And so I, I took courses in all of them. So I, I read the Quran quite a bit. I read the Old Testament. I never fully got to the New Testament, but I did do quite a bit of looking at Protestantism, which isn't isn't quite what you see in the Middle East. It's more it's more of versions of Catholicism. But um, but um, I do think to some extent it's about religion. I do think that that those are are distinguishing marks between people that people have not been always been able to overcome and certain things allow you to overcome them better than others and certain situations do places where there's intermarriage it's always one of my first questions is there intermarriage is it still happening here what's what's it like you know whether that's between Shias and Sunnis in a in a in a Muslim context or between Orthodox and and um, Christians um, or Orthodox and Muslim even in Bosnia, um, that that those are important questions still in some parts of the world, and and I think it's important to understand that. And I also think that um, storytelling is very much shared between these three religions. I've been fascinated to read, you know, the prophets. Um, many of the prophets who are familiar to Jews in the Old Testament are, are, are also in the Quran. And so you find, you know, the Joseph of the Quran and the Abraham of the Quran, as well as of the Old Testament. And I wanted to see that continuum because that is part of the, um, of the narrative of the region. And um, it's it's in the names Ibrahim, Abraham, mm-hmm. um, you know, and and I think we sometimes lose sight of those continuities and of the ancientness of of the place, um, and so I I like to remind people of that because it gives it part of its grandeur too, and we forget that in the middle of wars we just look at rubble and it just looks like rubble and it's so much more. Yeah. All right, well, I'm going to turn this over now to, uh, I have a lot more questions for you. Okay. And, you know, I, specifically, actually, about some of the things that are happening right now, the bombing of uh, and killing of journalists uh, in Gaza, bombing of buildings, uh, the history of that, uh, of trying to wipe out the media so that it can't cover what's going on on the ground. And uh, Israel has no monopoly on that. That's just, you know, the fact that journalists no longer have like the Red Cross, you know, safety on them. There, it's yeah. more like a bull. It's more like a um, 
what's it called? A bull bullseye. Bullseye, thank you. Um, but I'm gonna open this up now to someone in the audience named Robert. Uh, and he's asking, is there an answer to the disappearance of journalism of reporting and the rise of journalism of opinion? Mm. Wow. Um, well, I think there's always been both. And, and it, it's really important to remember that if we were in Europe, um, many news organizations would be associated with a government political party. So they would automatically lean more, more right, more left, more, there were, you know, all of the, the, in the 1930s and 40s in Italy, certainly many fascist publications, there were underground publications. So there's, uh, journalism for much of its history has not been, um, uh, it has not even aspired to being agnostic although it has often expired to being, to being uh, revelatory and to, to showing abuses of different kinds. But generally that was you know, various labor organizations and, and things like that. So I think that's important to, to, to point out. The other, the other thing though, is that America has developed this tradition of attempting to find a, a more neutral way to present journalism. And that's, that's very much a 20th, century sort of post, I would say probably post-World War II. And I think today people going back and looking at that journalism would find all kinds of biases that we perhaps didn't recognize at the time, whether that's um, racial biases or biases against women. I mean, to this day, if you look at a, most major publications, they will under quote experts who are women and uh, and experts of color, and they will quote mostly men. That's changing. But in other words, there are all kinds of biases that work their way in. But I think that what we have seen recently is a re-politicization of language and this capacity to spread information or opinion and news very, very quickly through, through the internet, which now isn't only on our computers after all, it's everywhere, it's on our phones. We have it buzzing next to us constantly. So the ability to have the time to make distinctions has, has really evaporated. Um, and I'm gonna go down this list here. We have a few other people. Um, this is from Joanne Richards. Where does citizen journalism fit into the larger discussion of integrity in journalism? Well, I guess I would say it depends on the citizen, but it, <laughs> right? I mean, but obviously citizen journalism has a, a, a very important role to play because people are everywhere. And without their eyes, there is so much we would not know that has helped to direct Trained journalists to really focus and gather information. I mean, the, the obvious um, example here is, is the recent um, killing of George Floyd and, and, and the videos that were taken by people on the scene who just were horrified. And that became the material that worked its way. And then was many, many things were done with that by professional journalists, some of which a citizen journalist couldn't readily do. They, journalism organizations do have capacities to match it to then makes, you know, we all kinds of tabulations were done of how many similar killings were done, so how many similar cases, all that kind of thing, which is, I think, beginning to change the conversation. But it has certainly taken a long time. And the same is crucial, has been crucial to all our reporting on Syria without citizen journalists, without people on the scene with their cell phones who then sent out what they saw, we would have no idea what was going on in that country. And so that is a very, very important, I mean, to me, it's integrity. It's, it's the moment, they capture the moment. Is it everything? Can it be misleading? Of course, like every snapshot, um, you have to know more, but it's at least a start. Otherwise you don't even have the start. Uh, we have Reg Jones saying, what are your views with regard to the future of Afghanistan as the US and NATO totally remove troops from the country? Hmm. Oh, I don't know if I have views exactly. I mean, I'm, 
I, I'm very, very torn um, because if you look at the past 20 years, US has been there and spent a lot of money. It's lost some troops. Um, it's now spending relatively little money, but it has not made a real advance, a real change in recent, um, in recent years. Um, it did manage to get a lot of girls into school, especially in urban areas. That's not a small thing. But that was also something to some extent Afghan people wanted. I mean, they had had that under the communists, under the Russians in, in the 80s. Um, rural areas remained very uh, punitive towards women. Now the Taliban are back in many of them, despite the American presence. So I have to ask myself, is this, is it worthwhile for the Americans to stay? Does it, what will it, what will it forestall? It will forestall considerable pain for some Afghans, but will it actually improve life? And if America was to stay, would they need to stay indefinitely? And my answer is probably yes. I don't know what the answer is. I, I am horrified about what will happen to women. I think it will be terribly difficult. Um, I think academics will face a rough time. Anyone who um, is more independent, probably major cities will remain um, somewhat as they are, but it will be a more turbulent place where you wouldn't wanna raise your children. So is that a point of view? I'm not sure. It's a, <laughs> it's a sad recognition, a sad yeah. recognition of a terrible history. Um, I wanna ask you though, I, I'm, I just got a note that I, I have time to, uh, to ask the question I, I really wanna ask you about, which is um, the attack on journalists. I mean, obviously um, journalists in the areas you've been working and you've talked about how scary and difficult it is just to, to do the work that you do but you know, they've been kidnapping by all these sort of militia groups and you know, whatever. But the fact that Israel knowingly bombed a building that had the Associated Press and Al Jazeera. And then actually, if you look back over the last few days and weeks, uh, days certainly, they bombed several other media mm -hmm. organizations. So they, they killed a reporter in Gaza, either this morning or yesterday. Um, and that's of course separate from you know, but when you bomb a very tightly congested urban area, you're, you're gonna kill children and all kinds of innocents. But I wanna speak specifically about the attack on journalists, because of course, if you go back to uh, Baghdad, I don't know how many, you know, at the- 2001, when everything was yeah, gonna 2003, be, yeah. You know, the bombing of Al Jazeera yeah. then, and also the bombing, mm -hmm. the tank that was shooting into the Palestine hotel. hotel. Which, mm -hmm. I mean, that was, anyone on the street knew that's where the journalists were. So it's not lack of information. So what, and also they, one of the places that the Israelis bombed was um, a uh, human rights, organ it was an organization to protect Palestinian journalists and also an organization, uh, a women's rights organization. So, I mean, you, you know these situations better than most people when, when actual armies rather than these sort of rogue insurgencies justify bombing buildings with journalists in them. And of course the head of AP said, and else others, this is designed so that people can't see what's going on here. You, know, you don't have to get into a Hamas versus Israel battle here over mm -hmm. what's justified, but when you make it impossible for journalists to do their job, finish that thought. Well, I mean, look, of course, you're going to see much less of what is horrifying and therefore protect yourself from some of the international judgment that would otherwise come down on you. But already by doing that, I mean, Israel is really no different from so many other states. I mean, Syria did that repeatedly and, and killed both Western and, and Syrian journalists. Um, it certainly has happened in, you know, in, in other, other places. Um, and overall, if you look at the world, it is getting more dangerous for journalists. The Committee to Protect Journalists has documented, you know, increasing numbers of assassinations, threats, uh, you know, people ending up 
ending up dead. It, there are different ways that journalists are, are um, being signaled to stop reporting. And, um, you know, Israel, I believe their defense was that they had told the landlord of the building to get everyone out of it. But the, the intent is clear. They're, they bombed it to make it difficult to come back. So the equipment isn't very usable. So you don't feel safe. Who goes back to a building that's been bombed? You have to be, you know, suicidal. Um, and so um, it's, it's a very, it's a very chilling thing to see in a country that, you know, the US has treated as an ally. But, you know, it's, it's hardly, it's hardly remarkable. It's actually, to me, very much um, in, in the tradition of what Assad did too. Mm -hmm. are, are they so different um, on how they're treating this situation? Perhaps not. They don't want, they want to reduce. I don't think they expect to eliminate the number of witnesses. They know there'll be material, but this reduces, reduces it, slows it, gives them a little more time. It's extremely cynical, um, but you know, at the end of the day, they're betting on the sad reality that when lots of people are being killed and there's a risk of broader war and everything else, journalists are kind of going to get lost in the in the um, din of the overall situation, and they're not going to they're not going to cause an international incident. If it were a unique thing, maybe more so, but. Um, it, it was a calcul very calculated choice, I think. Oh, very and, calculated, yeah. yeah. And it, it yielded them what they would like, probably. Fewer pictures. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one final question here I think we have time for. Um, this is from Joanne Richards. Um, the kind of journalism that you do is expensive. What is the future of financially supporting investigative reporting? Wow, that is a fabulous, excellent question. It is expensive. It is incredibly expensive. And I am very fortunate to work for a news organization that is willing to pay for things like a, an amazing bureau in, in Kabul. And in fact, where um, Bernard Nasseter's son, Adam Nasseter, is the bureau chief right now. Um, and they are going to be able to tell you what happened. But that is a real rarity, and there are very few journalists left there on the ground. Um, I think that the future is very poor overall, and that one of the biggest missions that um, journalists, all of us, have to, to think about is how we can support freelancers or those who work for publications that cannot have bureaus. Um, how we share some resources, what kind of funding can be made available. Because when you, if you want to work in war zones or places which are, are they, they might also be marginal for reasons of climate. I mean, some of the places where people are going to be reporting on climate change will be very dangerous to work in. Um, they will be either very hot or very wet, or very cold, um, but, uh, but all of that requires equipment and, and preparation and um, backup plans for getting out, and all of that is expensive. And I think we, we have a commitment as a, as a profession to think hard about how we can make possible that continued reporting, because what we need is a diversity of voices, not you don't want just the New York Times or the Washington Post or the, uh, you know, NBC, ABC, NPR, public radio, um, you know, whatever it is, The Guardian, whatever, whoever it is you listen to, or, or for that matter, um, more conservative sources who might, um, whether, you know, that, that see different pictures. Uh, you also, you want you want all kinds of new organizations that maybe are only just now coming into existence. It is the diversity of voices that, that creates strong journalism, not, not one voice. Well, I think we're in our final roundup here. Uh, I wanted you to have an opportunity just to talk about stuff that we haven't asked you. And if you could roll into that, there's one final question here, and it actually relates to what you just said about the loss of local newspapers and local radio in the US. So. Um, yeah, just whatever haven't been asked and maybe uh, 
roll that into that. That okay. Um, no, I I think this is the most important point. It's that you know no one journalistic organization will tell you what you need to know to be a citizen of a country and what makes journalism rich is its diversity. Well, there's no way we can cover it all. So, um, you know, what you read in a local paper about something might illuminate corruption at a local level. And the New York Times will never be interested in that. But it's really important that you as a citizen of a county in, I don't know, Kansas, I pick in Kansas because I love Kansas and live there and uh, um, know about that and decide how you want to vote on that local ballot measure as a result. And so I, I really believe in the in having as many voices as possible, but voices that in some way are thinking about how we how we get at what's true and not just what we want to believe. We all want to believe certain things. I sometimes have wanted to believe that a politician who policy, whose policies I like was good. <laughs> and they turned out to be corrupt, but have some good policies. And that was really painful. I, you know, but that's, but that's part of what, what covering the real world is like and, and living in it and being a citizen of it. And so, um, I think that's that's one really important thing. And the other is that I really um, think it's so important not to look inward and only at America as if we are an island. We, we are not an island. We are, you know, maybe there was a time when we could make that, um, that choice, but we are connected, ir you know, ir irrevocably to the rest of the world, whether that's through the supplies we use to build our home or, you know, the books that are printed in foreign countries now, the whatever it is, it's, um, and, and through our foreign policy, through our environmental policy. And so it, it really is worth it to take time to, to read foreign news as well, because it is also our news. And so as someone who works overseas and sometimes feels that people kind of say, oh, well, that's far away. It's never quite as far as you think. So that would be one, one thought. Well, that's, I think, a great way to, uh, to roll up the carpet on this. Um, thank you so much, Alyssa. It's been a oh, pleasure. Thank and, you so much. Oh, it's really wonderful. Fun for me. Uh, I think we're there. Joanne? Yes, okay. thank yeah. you. <laughs> thank you both so much. Uh, what an interesting um, Nasser lecture. It was, uh, it was such a treat to listen to the both of you talk about the future of journalism. Um, lots to think about and a little nugget of hope, which I, I think is we all very, yeah. very little. <laughs> no, it was good. That was yeah, it. yeah. So thank you both. That was a wonderful event. My to pleasure. everyone in the audience, especially the folks from the Upper Valley who joined us on such a lovely night. Um, thank you for attending uh, tonight's event. This is our last Rocky Watch event of the spring term, but tomorrow at 445, we are co-sponsoring with the Department of Economics, a talk by Professor Rucker C. Johnson entitled, Children of the Dream, Why School Integration Works. So thank you for being here tonight and any other night that you joined us this term. Um, email rockefeller.center at dartmouth.edu to be put on our mailing list. We'll be back in the fall. Thank you all. <laughs>